in my current relationship or a feeling that I, I value the most in any relationship, and especially this one, is safety. I've, I love feeling safe in my relationship. And to me, you know, safety means the ability to communicate with my partner about insecurities and frustrations without the fear of being judged for them. Yes. Um, or criticized or have them weaponized against you. And for in future fights, you were single for a long, long time. time. Yeah. yeah, most of my thirties. I mean, if uh, was other, that weaponized against you a bunch? Oh yeah. I mean, before I met Natalie, it was like, who are you to give relationship advice? You've been single forever. And once in a while, I'll hear that from someone who's not paying close attention to my personal life. Uh, uh, and now, or it might be things about my relationship that people might not like or whatever. But yeah, there are people are always trying to, you know. I mean, like I said, I come from a reality TV space, so like I'm very. Uh, appreciative of the passion that the fans have, but there is a very kind of toxic side of, 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 of that fan base. It's, you know, it's basically sports, you know? It's like people love not only rooting for people, they love rooting against people. And that's something I just have to like accept. What are some of the things that people push on right now in your relationship? Lovers and friends. Lovers and friends. I'm gonna take you on a trip, baby, I don't pretend. I say, lovers and friends. Uh. I'm gonna hold you down, down to the end, I say. Welcome to season two of Lovers and Friends, a podcast. Now, what makes this week a new season versus last week? Honestly, not all that much. This is still a podcast about intimacy that is led by personal stories, grounded with research, and designed to inspire discussions in your own intimate lives. Meaning if you don't hear some things that make you want to share the episode with some people in your in circle, we're not doing our job around these parts. So that hasn't changed, but what has changed is the feeling and the flow that I want to ooze through our time together. And there really is no better way than I can explain this feeling than this excerpt from an episode that I actually shot today, and it's the same shirt, with singer JoJo. Is your anchor down or are your sails up? <laughs> you know a lot about both. This is a very nautical so conversation. Nautical. <laughs> I'm like, where the fuck am I? Um, <laughs> I'm taking things one day at a time and I'm I'm taking care of myself more than more than anybody else, if that makes sense. Yeah. Is your anchor down? I don't what know. does that mean? I'm thinking about that for myself. Does like, that mean that am, am I question? open for business? <laughs> is that very profound or very basic of me? Like right now in my life, I am in a sales up season. I want to explore. I want to use the wind to my advantage, but also I want to be led and see where other people's flow takes me. I want to start episodes with a question and end them with a couple or more ideas. So with that being said, again, welcome to season two. This week's question, what does it mean to be in a safe relationship? If I'm having a bad day, knowing that I'm safe enough to express all layers of me, not just the perfect feminine version that they might have met, but being safe to be all of me. For me, safety in a relationship comes down to trust and knowing that my partner would never intentionally do something to hurt me. Safety means never running away from the commitment and work it takes to build a solid, safe relationship. To me, safety is synonymous with trust. Someone who takes the time to truly understand you and get to know you on a deep, soulful level. And I also think it's someone who truly listens to you and your opinion, regardless of whether or not they agree with it. The ability to connect, to let myself be free, authentic, and also vulnerable with my partner with no fear of judgment. Being able to relax as well as know that I can be angry and it not backfire on me. For me, feeling safe in a romantic relationship means truly experiencing all that love has to give without the anxiety and the fear and the insecurity. Now, when I reflect on this for myself, two images come to mind, baseball and heaven. And if you're a sports fan, maybe those two things are one for you. Definitely not for me. Anyhow, baseball. I am running towards home base, towards safety, and everyone around me is on the other team trying to stop me. I'm talking emotions, bodies, beer bottles flying towards me, but their determination to scare me has nothing on my ambition, on my goal. So I put my head down and I press towards the bag. I throw myself at it and crash so hard that if I were an animation, my body would fall into a tidy pile of white bones. Then 
I breathe and I wait for someone else to tell me if it was worth it. Am I safe or am I out? Safe! Heaven. I finally did it. I made it to a place where there's no threats, no insecurities, no surprises, except like Jesus popping out of the cake. Surprise. And most importantly, a place where there's no more pain. I'm safe. I'm with people who love me and everyone agrees that the love that I have and me are both lovely. No one threatens to take my heaven away. And somehow all the changes that will ever be made, because let's be honest, a life or afterlife without change is boring. All of these changes from now until eternity are somehow designed with my comfort, joy, and safety in mind at all times. And I don't know how either of those scenarios sound to you, but here's what I really want you to hear and what I want you to reflect on during this entire episode. Many of us look at love like a game of baseball. One where yes, there's gonna be strikeouts and times where we think we have found a way home only to discover that we are actually right in the middle of a trap designed to eliminate us from the game altogether. But also baseball is a place where eventually we will slide into safety, a place where the good begins and the bad is all indisputably worth it. And let's have an honest moment here. How many of us actually do believe that there is a love out there where safety within that dynamic translates literally to the end of our insecurities and the beginning of an existence without pain? And look, sales up. I don't know what the absolute truth here is and what the possibilities are for every person. And I do know that there actually are experts who wanna promise you that this is possible. Literally, PhD Steven Stanzi, I believe, has two books on the matter called How to Improve Your Marriage Without Talking About It and Love Without Hurt. But on the flip side, I want to invite you to plan for a world where a safe love, a good safe love, is never actually all the way safe. There will likely always be external threats. One, other people's negativity towards your relationship, or two, other people's positive feelings towards those in the relationship that inspires them to want to break you and your loved one apart, plus internal threats. Because the only thing constant in this world is change, which must mean that heaven, at least the one here on earth, is a moment, not a milestone. And look, sometimes that moment can last for a decade. But on that 11th year when something shifts and what's safe becomes incredibly scary, I think it's important for us to embrace that reality in spite of its discomfort rather than reject our partner because of it. And I don't know if any of this is making all the way sense, but I do know that I'm saying it because me 2020 and down specifically needed to hear it. For most of my adult life, I yearned for a pain-free place in the form of love. And when I thought I found that in myself at a time, my sister and my husband, I placed so much pressure on these relationships to maintain this fantasy that I became inflexible to their changes, to my changes, and as a result, unsafe in the process. Last year, as I mentioned in the last podcast, was really the reckoning of all of that. And let me tell you, it was not pretty. It was necessary, but it didn't necessarily have to go down in this burn baby burn fashion that I took on. So with all this in mind, the question expands from just, what does it mean to be safe in a relationship to what will we do as a unit when we inevitably no longer feel safe because of our togetherness? Our starring guest this week, Nick Vial, and I talked about a lot of different stuff, but underneath it, I think that that's the core. One, how love hasn't been safe in the past for Nick. And then like, I kind of heard rumors that she was cheating on me, but I don't want to believe her type of thing. And I actually was, I, I proposed and then found, heard the rumors, but um, uh, I was very distraught and uh, I just couldn't get out of my own way, so to speak. And, and so that's what really got me into like being fascinated with relationship dynamics. And two, Nick and I talked about how he is redefining safety within his new relationship one that has external threats in the form of negative public opinion because of himself and his partner's 18 year age gap. And also the internal threats because that's often what happens when two people attempt to share one life. So we're gonna get into all of that right after this. 
Hi everyone, I want to introduce you to Krizia Cruz. If you have ever been a guest before on Lovers and Friends, a podcast, you know Krizia, and I'm so happy to introduce you to the entire audience. Yeah, I'm excited. Krizia, before you moved to LA, you saw yourself as a married woman and that was that. You meant it when you said for better or for worse, but the worst happened in your relationship and your husband left you. In light of that, what does a safe romantic love mean to you? Un amor seguro significa para mí que me siento valorada, entendida, escuchada y vista. I have zero idea what you just said. I know. But I want to tell you something. <laughs> In three weeks, I might know what you just said. Okay. I'm going to devote myself to actually doing this because you know that I've been obsessed with Spanish music. I'm obsessed with you. And I've been <laughs> to so many countries, they speak it. It's time that I actually learned it. And that is why I'm excited to tell all of you about Babbel. Babbel is the language learning app that sold more than 10 million subscriptions. Thanks to its addictively fun and bite-sized language lessons, you can feel confident no matter where the new year takes you. With Babbel, you only need 10 minutes to complete a lesson. So you can start having real life conversations in a new language in as little as three weeks. Right now, get up to 55% off your subscription when you go to babbel.com slash lovers. That is babbel.com slash lovers to get 55%. <laughs> Up to 55% off your subscription with Babbel, language for life. Nick Vial is a podcaster, an author, a television personality, an actor and model who you might know as The Bachelor on the 21st season of ABC's hit show. He was also a runner up on two consecutive seasons of The Bachelorette. He is currently the host of the Vial Files podcast where he talks about relationships and offers advice to his listeners. As if that was not enough, he recently released a national best-selling book, Don't Text Your Ex Happy Birthday, which you will see sitting between us during our conversation. <laughs> What's up? How's it going? Hi, Nick. Good to be with you. I'm excited to be with you too because, you know, we're the same. Are oh we, no, this got awkward hands? really quick. <laughs> <laughs> I lost my cue there. It's rare to talk to somebody who does something very similar than as you for a living. It's nice. How to, did you start? I started just being shitty and wanting to be better and then learning better and then being like, oh, other people should know this. Yes, uh, I guess in a way, maybe the, maybe the same. More, Mine was more like just making a lot of fuck ups and mistakes. Yours and, wasn't The Bachelor? No. No, people, I feel like there's a common misconception. I feel like The Bachelor, I, I relapsed. You know, because of like a lot of things I talk about, I think were more formative uh, from experiences I had in my 20s. And like I was very much like, you know, I grew up in a very traditional conservative family, right? And Midwest. And so like I was taught, all, you know, and I, I saw a lot of great things by my parents who are still together, still in love, blah, 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 all that great stuff. But um, I think I think it's something a lot of people struggle with that I th I find is that, you know, like modern dating has changed so much, right? And yet um, I think our playbook in our head is still the same. And that playbook is usually just kind of some very simple version of love is special and you need to fight for it and do whatever it takes, right? And I think that's- Which sounds like the log line for The Bachelor. Yeah, right? This season on The Bachelor. Everything has led to this moment. So that I could prove to America that if you don't give up on love, that eventually you'll find it. This could all blow up in my face. Um, and so when I started dating, obviously as a young man and a teenager and I fell in love, it was just like, I got to do whatever it takes to make this work and, and fight no matter what or how bad it was or how toxic it was and, and things like that. And I was very bad at accepting reality, you know, in a sense of of really just thinking about, is this healthy? Is this right for us? You know, it was like, love can conquer all and, and things like that. And I think that got me into some, you know, heartbreaking situations. And, it, you know, I'm, I'm also a competitive, stubborn, you know, determined person. And so that kind of, th those traits kind of compiled. And so um, I went through some tough breakups in my 20s. And after um, I was, uh, I think it was like 26-ish, I don't know, but I got engaged. And I, you know, ultimately got engaged for all the wrong reasons, which was like, I, like in the, I could feel the relationship slipping away. You know, I could, we didn't, at that point, I don't even think. Before we, the ring or after the ring? Before, you know, and then we like moved in, 
you know, hoping that would change things because it was a, it was a relationship solely based off of truly like our first two weeks of dating of, of loving the way we looked and like oversimplified things of like, you know, my original girlfriend who we dated, uh, we dated off and on for seven years. And it was kind of like, we broke up a bunch of times and, and I needed to meet the second one to kind of get over the first one. And other than, you know, I thought she was beautiful and funny and smart and nice. And, and she so was your fiance was a rebound. Yeah, in a way, um, very much so. And uh, and she went to church, and I was going to church every Sunday. Then I was raised Catholic, and and I fought with my other girlfriend about like the fact that she wasn't comfortable going to church. And I thought, you know, well, we're supposed to, you know, kind of thing. And she did. And so it was very much like the idea of what I thought I was looking for. And and then you realize that you're so much of a, of a relationship. You're trying to just make sure you're you're protecting that those first two weeks of a relationship, so to speak, yes. in a way, if I'm making any sense. And 100%. A lot of times the sign for me that a relationship is not a healthy one is when I ask somebody, what was the peak? Like, what was that magical moment that you felt like this makes sense? Like, this is the love story that I want to lean into. If people reference the first two weeks or the first time they met, that's a red flag. Sure. Yeah. Like, if you didn't progress, you know, as you got, because yeah. it's all about gradual, mutual, reciprocal revealing of yourself. So yeah. midway through should be really like the magical point or towards the left or yesterday. But if you're like the first time we met, yeah. that's a usually a red flag. Yeah, it should hopefully be fairly recent. And even if you don't have like some sort of like, I'd be more even concerned of like, oh, this one moment. You know, I'd love to, if, if you ask that question, I'd love for someone to say, well, wow, there's just a, I don't know if there's this big moment, but there's, I can give you several like these really nice moments or whatever, yeah. you know, because I really, you know, I talk about this in the book too, where I talk about how you never stop learning. And I was, you know, cause like I talked to a lot of people about the relationships as you do. And, and there's this thing, again, I, th I think people literally will stop learning. You know, it's like, there's people want to find love so badly sometimes you start dating you have the fun honeymoon phase you hook up all of a sudden someone's like i love you you're like, i love you too that's great and and then from that point forward i think people are just trying to preserve that feeling rather than like evolve it hi jared brady hey welcome to the ad break i'm here in 2021 at the end of the year we got into arguably one of the biggest fights in our relationship do you recall no not what? I don't. I don't know what you're talking about. It was around Adam's wedding. I can't remember. I don't know. <laughs> okay, this is ruining everything. <laughs> <laughs> and I weaponized things against you by being like, I thought you would never do things to that I didn't know. I thought mm. you would never hurt me. Do you recall okay. now? Yeah. Okay. And I wanted to apologize because in retrospect, actually, as I'm putting together this episode, I was angry because you changed in a way that... I didn't understand. Mm. And rather than trying to lean into understanding you, I just got mad at you for being different than I expected. Um, and yeah, I would have handled it really differently today. Mm. No, I, yeah, I, <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you. The second thing I want to tell you is that we went to the club a month ago, yeah. a few or three weeks ago with your friends. Yeah. And one of your friends said, we need to move because it smells like somebody in this area is It was you. It was me. Yeah. I assumed. I knew. <laughs> Luckily, there's a solution for the awkward gut stuff. Ritual and Symbiotic Plus created a clinically studied three-in-one prebiotic, probiotic, and postbiotic to help support a balanced gut microbiome. With two of the world's most clinically studied probiotic strains to support the relief of mild and occasional bloating, gas, and diarrhea. Symbiotic Plus and Ritual are here to celebrate, not hide your insides. There is no more shame in your gut game. That's why Ritual is offering my listeners, our community, our people, 10% off during your first three months. I love it. Visit ritual.com slash lovers to start Ritual and to add Symbiotic Plus to your subscription today. You were single for a long, long time. Long time, yeah, yeah. Most of my 30s. I mean, if... Uh, was other... that weaponized against you a bunch? Oh, yeah. I mean, before I met Natalie, it was like, who are you to give relationship advice? You've been single forever. And once in a while, I'll hear that from someone who's not paying close attention to my personal life. Uh, 
Uh, and now, or it might be things about my relationship that people might not like or whatever, but yeah, there are, people are always trying to, you know, I mean, like I said, I come from a reality TV space, so like I'm very, uh, appreciative of the passion that the fans have, but there is a very kind of toxic side of, 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 of that fan base. It's, you know, it's basically sports, you know, it's like people love not only rooting for people, they love rooting against people. And that's something I just have to like accept. What are some of the things that people push on right now in your relationship? Um, but you know, like obviously like Nally is younger than me, so there's an age difference in our relationship. And so obviously that's probably the, the biggest thing that people like to, to bring up, uh, to, to nitpick on my relationship and things like that. But like I said, I don't really respond to certainly critics and, um, but you know, we'll talk about it on the show a little bit or, you know, people will call in with, you know, the same, you know, Hey, I'm dating this person. I like them. There's an age gap. How do you think that plays a role and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I just think. You know, I think it's important for couples to acknowledge where they could, there, there might be some incompatibility and not freak out, but just talk about when we feel that incompatibility, how do we respond to that? How do we communicate? And that's something that like Nally and I have done, especially when it comes to our age difference. And again, it doesn't pop up a lot, but every once in a while, I think we will say, you yeah, know, this, this might be because of this. All right, fine. Well, how do we deal with that? Rather than pretending it's not that. And I think often in dating, uh, we like to pretend what we're doing is normal or isn't the exception. You know, for example, if there is an age gap, they like to say, well, age doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter. They're mature for their age or blah, 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 blah. Right. And that and certainly, you know, Nellie, for example, is an exceptional woman and we had very different childhoods, which plays a big role. I mean, she's the youngest of seven. I'm the second oldest of 11. That plays a role, too, in terms of maturity level and her life experience, yada, yada, yada. But you, I think it's, just, it's important to acknowledge that there is a difference. And there is, it is important to acknowledge that there will, will be moments in the relationship that we will feel that age difference. Not all the time. Hopefully, I mean, hopefully not a lot and not all the time, but to pretend that it doesn't exist I think is a mistake for people. Uh, it would be a mistake for us, right? When I first met her, um, it was like, we can't date. I'm, we're just, just, I just, because I just, I assumed, right? I just, I didn't know anything about her. I didn't know she was this exceptional woman that was, for me, the exception to the rule. And I didn't realize how compatible we were. And I didn't realize how easy it was for us to connect. And I didn't, e I didn't realize how it was very much to feel like she was my equal. You know, I had to get to know her first, but I just, I just saw this young woman and I was like, I just don't, this is, this is not going to work out. And thank God for her. She was a determined person who was like, I don't give a shit what you say. I know this is what I want and I'm going to pursue it, you know? And i you know, think I'm very lucky that she did. How um, long did that turnover take for you? Well, we, we, you know, we hooked up for about nine, nine months when she lived in a different part of the, the country at the time. And so, you know, that created... I, that really worked, honestly, worked to our benefit because it allowed us to get to know each other over a longer period of time that made me feel comfortable and safe to open up to her because I was single for a long time. And when I met her, I was like, it's, it's, she can't be my person. Like, you know, like this, this can't be it, you know? And, and I was able to slowly get to know her and we would hang out every, like we would get together every month, give or take. And, and I just found myself really connecting with her and and in about nine months she 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 um put her foot down and set some hard boundaries and uh made me make a choice and i made it yeah what was the choice to make being in a relationship with her or not you know yes. and um and i talk about defining a relationship a lot and i gotta give her credit because she she kind of gave me that kind of well wow this is brilliant what she did and I, I people always ask me all the time like how do I define a relationship when do I ask what are we I'm like never you know um because it was you know I was so intoxicated by kind of the power that Natalie brought to our relationship when she I, 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 we were at Peter Luger's in Brooklyn and we were meeting up in New York and she just said listen I just I want to tell you why I think we should be together and she just was very calm about it. She was very articulate. And I just listened. And at the time, I was like, I still don't think so. But, <laughs> um, and then she said, okay, you know, I just need to get it out there. And 
And then she just started changing her behavior with me and started pulling away. And it wasn't like a threat and it wasn't like a you know, react. It was just like, I'm setting a boundary. I was like, you know, and then I, I had this, you know, talk with some friends and, and I'm like, I think I'm really nervous about, um, of saying yes to this because I'm really scared about these potential challenges our relationships face. And then I thought to myself, well, shit, man, I, I've, I've, I've been single for a long time and you know, I went from being the helpless romantic guy in my early twenties who was like this, you I like you, you like me, fuck it. Like let's, let's date, let's just be in love. This is good. And then I went from more of a kind of skeptical, pessimistic, not pessimistic, but just a little bit more pragmatic in my decisions and a little more thoughtful, which, you know, took a little bit of the romance out of it and things like that. And I kind of realized, I'm like, I, I, I need to take a chance, you know, like it was easier when you're, you know, ignorance is bliss, you know, when you're, when you haven't been heartbroken and you haven't had failed relationships, it's easier to say yes to the maybes. And I think once you start experiencing life and you experience a little bit of pain and disappointment, it's harder to say yes to the maybes. You're more like, I don't know, you want more of a sure thing. And so finally I just realized like, I, I need to say yes to this. It still might not work out, but I, I need to see this through because, you know, I think there's a lot of potential good here. And, and thankfully I did. I think it's interesting to listen to your stories. When we first started, you talked about that first two weeks with your ex fiance being the best and that time that you want to preserve that magic. We look great together, yeah. this makes sense. The story that we're telling is an awesome story. Where in this relationship, it was the flip. Yeah, The first bit was probably the most uncomfortable part oh, of yeah. your relationship together. Yeah, I was, um, I'm, I'm hard to get to know. I was definitely hard to get to know with Natalie because it was, you know, part of that was, you know, being in the public eye uh, and things like that. You know, uh, when I met Natalie, you know, she, she had no exposure. I mean, certainly she had had friends in, in the industry and known people, but I, w I didn't know much about her. I didn't even know that. So I was very kind of guarded and very careful what I kind of shared with people. And so I, and that's something I had to kind of face myself um, and work through those challenges. It was like, well, if I want to connect with someone, I have to be willing to give and, and let someone get to know me. But yeah, it was definitely the opposite yeah, for sure. And it's also interesting too, we talked about with her with boundaries. Cause I always think about boundaries in that way that people use them a lot now, like guard dogs. Sure. And instead they're actually like gates to keep you in. So it's not a way to push you out. It's like, let me define, cause I don't put boundaries that people I don't care about. I put a boundary to say like, I want us to keep enjoying each other yeah. and I want to enjoy being with you. So these are boundaries that are in place so that we can stay together. Yeah. So her- I allowing, I guess, putting distance was actually an act of care for you. Cause she's like, I don't want to turn into a resentful, bitter person. Totally. So I know if I divest in these ways in our connection, I'll still be able to at least fuck with you. Totally. And I always say like, boundaries aren't for other people. They're for yourself. You know, expectations are what you communicate to other people so that you can like enforce the boundaries you have for yourself. Because yeah, it's like, what do I want? Am I going to hang out with someone that I'm growing feelings for that isn't giving these things in return? Yes or no. Am I going to do that? No. You know, and, and I think it's really important to realize that your boundaries are for yourself. They're not, they're not for other people. They're not for weaponized. What are you going to do with the information that you have? And then how are you going to communicate that through expectations? So you told me a really great story. I asked you for a story about coming to your partner with the wonderful hack of a sentence, which I will utilize. Okay. Starting it off with, I am insecure about. Yeah, um, I was, uh, Nellie and I were, uh, I was, I was, I was, I was feeling insecure about, you know, um, she moved to LA for me, but obviously making friends is important. And so she met some great group of friends, love her friends, you know, and you could tell that she was really enjoying her friends. And, but also like we were, we were getting less quality time. So instead I was like, all right, I'm really, I'm feeling insecure about this. And I really like to talk to you about it. And I recognize I might be a little sensitive about this. And I just wanted to talk with you, but me centering my insecurity and leading with that, I think was a very kind of way to diffuse potential conflict because then it became about us talking to help me feel less insecure. 
And as long as I was willing to acknowledge that and not get defensive, because like oftentimes that's what will happen, you know, like, well, hey, babe, like, I don't feel like we're spending enough time together, you know, fight, 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 Ten minutes later, well, you're just insecure, yeah. you know, <laughs> and I just took that out of the equation. I am feeling a little insecure about this. And I would like for us to figure out a way for me not to feel that way because I don't want her, you know, if, if I think to myself, if my girlfriend said, well, I'm feeling insecure, I, I don't want her to feel that way. And I certainly don't want to weaponize that, you know, ultimately we have to deal with our insecurities on our own to a certain degree and our partners are there to help, help with that. And so I was just kind of asking for her help and everyone wants to, to help people. So instead of making it about a, a problem that I needed her to fix by changing something, we talked and we didn't fight. And it really was great. And we, we made some very simple adjustments and I recognized some insecurities and she recognized some like, you know, I, I could have, you know what, I, I should be a little bit more considerate here. I was a little inconsiderate there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think that's such an important differentiation too between a safe relationship doesn't mean that I no longer feel insecure. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, finally I'm with somebody that everything is perfect and they never evoke uncomfortable feelings out of me yeah. but instead it's that i can have those feelings and bring them to you in a way that can be workshopped totally and i think for a lot of people they interpret safety as like you'll never make me feel bad you'll never make me feel yeah, insecure yeah. i'll never be hurt by you i'll never be surprised or blindsided by you and i actually had a really awesome experience after our first baby about six or seven months later i was really blindsided by something that jared did or was experiencing and afterwards it was such a great moment for me because it broke apart this idea that I knew everything or that there was nothing left to uncover. Yeah. And it's scary too, right? Because we, we do change. And I think we sometimes will sense our partners experiencing a change and, that, and that's scary. And if you've been in a relationship where the relationship changed, not for the better, you know, that can be a, kind of a triggering event, you know, like, um, and so, yeah, I think it's just, it's, you have to just really be willing to check in and talk and, and realize that change is, is, I think it's change is always good. We're, we're always changing as people. We just have to, do you want to change together or do you want to grow apart? And it's also scary to date somebody that you're like, I have no idea what the fuck you're capable of. That's it frightening. Is. Yeah, so if I can assume that I can answer all the questions for you or assume your next move, that's comforting. It is, yeah. And it is a balance, right? Because uh, we love to say things like, I feel like I've known you forever, you know, yes. stuff like that. And or I know you better than you know yourself. Yeah. And and yeah, it, it is. I think it is a balance because you, you want to have security. And in, 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 I mean, people ask me, like, what's, like, what's the in my current relationship or a feeling that I, I value the most in any relationship and especially this one is safety. i I love feeling safe in my relationship, you know? So I understand that, but I, I guess it just depends what you mean by safety. And to me, you know, safety means the ability to communicate with my partner about insecurities and frustrations without the fear of being judged for them. Yes. Um, or criticized or have them weaponized against you. And for in future fights and, and just knowing that I'm with someone who kind of has that grace and understanding and, and is willing to share their own insecurity and trust me with their insecurities. The love story that you talked about that. Did that make any sense? Yes, it <laughs> okay, made great. perfect sense. I actually think that the idea of insecurities overall is just a really beautiful topic. Um, when you started loving or trying to love, the story that you were championing was the one that we're all told that you got to fight, fight, fight for yeah. love. What's your edit on that today based on what you know now? Um, that's a great question. Um, cause I do think you have to fight for love. I think you just have to, I, my edit on that, I guess is, um, I think when you are in a relationship or your relationship is starting, I think it's a, a, a conversation couples often don't have, especially young couples, is talking about what love means to them or what feeling love means to them. Maybe that's the short way of saying it. Yeah, know what you're fighting for, have that baseline, and be willing to accept that um, love sometimes can end, relationships can end, and sometimes that's the healthiest option. What are you fighting for? In my relationship? Um, it could be overall in terms of your quest for love. I don't know if you have the answer if this is your 
a love story or your life love story yet? Yeah. Uh, what am I fighting for? Um, contentment. Yeah. I have, it's, it's just something I constantly work on. I have a hard time feeling content and, um, and, 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 and appreciating what I have. Um, and uh, Natalie really helps me out with that. Shout out to Nick Vial. Such a joy to talk to somebody who shares a passion with you and shares that passion with the world in the same way that you do. And if you want to share in what Nick is putting down, sorry guys, this was awkward, but here we are. Go and get his book. It is really, really great. I'm very happy to have it. Go listen to his podcast. I believe he said he podcasts four times a week. He's hashtag goals for me to get to that space. Um, and just follow him on Instagram, which is always a safe space to get all of the above and information and notifications on when new things are happening with that person. And all of that will be in the show notes. All right, speaking of show, it must go on. And ooh, does it go. Up next, we have my favorite person. You know, that's a collection. My favorite, one of my favorite people to round things out with. Hi, I'm Lauren Morrison. I'm a certified personal and business coach, and you can find me at www.maketheshiftcoach.com, or you can find me on all platforms like Instagram and TikTok and YouTube at Make the Shift with Lauren. Lauren is here to give us two genius and doable solutions to manage the bottomless fear of being hurt by or because of our romantic partnerships. And we get to those, you guessed it, right after this. Picture this, you're not feeling well. So you go to the internet, you're trying to find a cause for your symptoms, and all of a sudden you stumble down a rabbit hole full of questionable advice from so-called internet experts. Now, Ryu is home from daycare today because on Thursday, she was sent home early for being lethargic. No fever, no cough, just an inexplicable somberness and lack of energy that left everyone, of course, especially her parents, feeling really concerned. So I was tempted to try and Google our way out of it, but then I remember that there are better and smarter ways to get answers that we need and to find an expert that we can trust, not just a random stranger on the internet. With ZocDoc, you are in good hands. ZocDoc helps you find quality doctors who focus on you, listen and prioritize your care. ZocDoc is the only free app that lets you find and book doctors who are patient reviewed, take your insurance, are available when you need them and treat almost every condition under the sun. When you're not feeling your best and just trying to hold it together, finding great care should not take up the last bit of energy that you have. And that's where ZocDoc comes in. Using their free app that millions of users rely on, you can find the right doctor that meets your needs and fits your schedule. Book an appointment with a few taps in their app and start feeling better faster with ZocDoc. Go to ZocDoc dot com slash lovers and download the ZocDoc app for free and then find a top rated doctor today. Many are available within 24 hours. I'm going to spell it out because saying it is harder than it should be. That is Z or Z, depending on what country you're in, Z-O-C-D-O-C dot com slash lovers. In case of an emergency, please break. What is behind the glass? What are we talking about? Oh my gosh. <laughs> this would have been so good if you just picked up what I was putting down. <laughs> I'm in a loving union. We're both committed to it. Unfortunately, not everybody will be supportive. Unfortunately, my partner may do things that are harmful to me. And when I keep that reality in mind, I want to prepare for those moments. So here are some tools that can help me when I find that I've been betrayed or harmed by the person that I care about. And I think uh, you just even going back to your word safe because, and you used to do this exercise too, where it's like, when I'm in a relationship, what are the things that I want to feel? And when we say things like safe, it's like safe for what? Um, because there's all different kinds of realms of safety and safe from who? So I think like when we talk about in a relationship and I think about safety, there's a safety in terms of, you know, us against the world. In other words, others may not approve of us, but we're strong together. And safety in a sense of that we value we each, we, we have the psychological safety within our relationship to be able to have healthy conflict with one another so that we can weather the storms. So when people are feeling an attack on their love. For 
from external forces, what are some strategies that they can employ to fight back together or if they're the only person there alone on behalf of the partnership? I guess when it comes to doing anything you care about, it's being connected to, to, to the why of it, to being connected to the so what of it. It's like if you're a tree and your roots are deep, then you can withstand the wind, right? Um, so like first answering the questions, like why am I in this relationship? Because if I need to answer that question for other people, can I answer that for myself? Popping in because I really want you to do this activity. So here's a template to help you get started. I also want to note that knowing the answer to why someone else not only helps you defend against other people's objections, but also other people's interjections. So in thinking of a relationship triangularly, you, your romantic mate, and the relationship you share, fill in these blanks. I choose this person because they are insert a couple of things about them that make them special to you. I am with this person because through them I become. And lastly, together, only we can. If you are down, share your answers with me via IG stories or Twitter, and I'll share mine there too. Okay, back to Lauren. Because your relationship that you're protecting has to have purpose. It has to have a so what. The more, I, I, I think that the more purpose your relationship has, the deeper those roots go. And then you can stand a bit more comfortable in the, it's not comfortable by any means, but you can stand with a bit more strength for the inevitable win that's gonna come. Internally, what strategies can you employ in order to weather the storm that you create together as a unit? When navigating difficult conversations, there's a tool called the Experience Cube. And kind of the easy way to remember the cube is, oh, what the fuck, right? So, O oh, for observation. Observation is about what are the facts? In other words, this is something that can be picked up on camera. It can be recorded. If I look at you, I'm like, your lips are pursed. That's an observation. The thought is the judgment or assumption that I attribute to that observation. You, your lips are pursed. I take that to mean that you're pissed off. And acknowledging that those two things are separate means that you acknowledge that your version of your interpretation of that observation is just that. It's your interpretation. It's your experience. The judgment and assumption that you're applying to that observation is based on years and years of experiences that you have. You didn't answer the phone. Observation. What is my judgment or assumption about that? You don't care about me. And then the F is the feeling word. And a lot of people skip this because again, it's like, I feel like I feel that. And those are thoughts and assumptions again. But the feeling word is so important and it's an emotion word because it connects the person to the so what of your, of why you're even bringing this up. And I even use this with like Cairo and Zara. And it's like, when, because they can't, they're, they're bickering with one another. And it's like, what is the feeling word? What, is, what does Zara make you feel? And when he points out the word like ashamed or insecure, that hits her different. She's like, I don't want that. It's not what I want. That's not what I was going for. So you, you, you connect to the person a little bit more and you can understand them a little bit more. And then the W is for the want. What do you want? What is the request? What is the desire that you have? And when you think about like something like relationships, like, you know what I mean? Like, cause we immediately go from observation to thought and that's it. Yeah. We leave everything out of the, of the conversation. And sometimes we skip observation. We just do thought. We just do thought. We just mix the two. You don't love me. You don't love me. Right. But if you slow your brain down enough to move through those stages then you can objectively look at what did he do specifically that we can both agree happened that made me feel unloved. It's almost like therapy in a cube. Mm, I love that. I wonder if in presenting this to somebody, if it should be, oh, fuck the what? Yes, absolutely. It's not that you have to follow the letters in order. It's about, are you incorporating all the letters? Because in Nick's case, it would have been feeling first. I'm feeling insecure. Yes. Observation. You're hanging out with your friends all the time. Thought. 
you're not that interested in spending time with me anymore. Even all the time is a, is a, is a judgment. That's true. So here, let's, let's try it again. Feeling, I'm feeling insecure about our quality time. Observation, you spend a lot of time with your friends. It's tricky because even in that, in that observation, even though you edited it, there were still judgments. And that's hard because the judgment comes so easy to us. Well, how, how could you observe that differently? What is my definition of a lot versus your definition of a lot? Because that, and that's, and that's the thing is like, should it be quantified? Like you hung out with your friends three times this week. Yes. That is something that we can all agree has happened. You hung out with your friends three out of five nights this week. I feel insecure about that because I think that you would rather spend time with your friends than you will with me. And I want us to find a way to spend more time together. It's interesting because I love the cube because I think you rearrange the letters based on who you're talking to. Yeah. Because for some people, starting the conversation with you hung out with your friends three out of five days this week, whatever you say next doesn't matter because they're already back up against the wall. Mm -hmm. They're like, this person has come with a case. I know, I think the mistake I've made in my relationship in particular is I start with the thought. Yeah. And then I have to come up with 50,000 observations to back it up mm -hmm. because they're like, like when? Yeah. And now I have to start pulling on stuff from 1905 because I'm trying to build a case to get this person to understand. And then their interpretation is, oh, you've been harboring this for a long time. Right. I think best for Jared would be feeling first, want second, mm -hmm. then observation and finally thought. But even the acknowledgement, and sometimes I, I look at the cube as like a way to prepare for a conversation, right? So even in preparing for it, and you'd walk it yourself, before you walk it with Jared, you walk it yourself. And even it, it's like, what I, you know, what I liked about what Nick was saying, it's like acknowledging. What is the thing they're gonna call me out for? And how can I acknowledge that in the conversation? So even if you led with an observation, I've seen, I, you know, you spent three out of five days, nights this week with your friends. Now, this is just my thought, but it makes me think that you don't want to spend time with me. And that makes me feel insecure. But acknowledge that there's something, I know that something else could be true about this. So really, I just want to understand. I want to hear the other perspective. Because when you slow your brain down, it's like, the, the reason it's called the experience cube is because it's acknowledging that your experience is unique to you. Yeah. And it's not the same experience as the person you're speaking to. Acknowledging that the other person in the exact same scenario is experiencing something completely different and neither is right or wrong, but it's an acknowledgement of each other's experience. Do you know I'm having a big aha of us having this conversation? This is what happened to us last year. If in a retrospect in learning this from you today i could learn how to fuck thoughts <laughs> or wants what would be your order um i would say otfw i would say that now i will say that there's often times where it's like o and t period i actually don't have a single thing more to say <laughs> Your carpet's very clean. Thank you. Yeah, I could eat off of this carpet. You could. <laughs> <laughs> this shed is very, it's new. We've got new lights mm -hmm. up. I observe that there's no darkness on the bottom of my white socks. <laughs> that makes me think that you've taken some time to clean this. And that makes me feel appreciated. Do I also need you to observe? Your you got a pedicure. Yeah. Oh, you very. Oh, sorry. That's a judgment. Your nails are painted. <laughs> <laughs> Your nails are painted. Good for you. Good for you for taking care. And? Your feet aren't pretty. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they are. I have gel nail polish for the first time. Okay. <laughs> you think I have ugly feet? I didn't say they're ugly. You said aren't pretty, though. They aren't pretty. <laughs> <laughs> what is that? Where does that leave me? Somewhere in the middle. <laughs> Well, I accept your observation <laughs> and I feel that's a, that was my judgment. Yeah. <laughs> I accept your judgment. 
This was great. I really thought this was great. I thought we nailed it. Yeah, I think so too. You feel that? I feel that. Lauren recently put up on Instagram that she grew her business by over a thousand percent last year. I just want to say I'm so incredibly in awe of you. I am happy for you. I am proud of you. And I am very proud to continue to encourage people to interact with Lauren and engage with the incredible services that she offers, both for free or paid if you're looking for a heavier investment from her. In either case, I genuinely do believe that she makes people's lives better. And if you want a better life, it's a pretty good advertisement, make sure you go to maketheshiftcoach.com. Also, while I have my phone out right now, it's a great time to put the pressure on you to rate and review the podcast. And what better way to pressure you than to praise those who have already done it? Because that's what you do in parenting. You uplift the good children, so you guilt the other ones. So I have read before in a book. Kidding, that's not how you do it. Anyways, K Danny B says, I love listening to this show. You always really have interesting conversations and I appreciate the vulnerability. I also work in communications and I really appreciate the care you put into recording and placing your ads. We do put a lot of care into that. I recommend the show to anyone and everyone who will let me. This actually is my favorite ad show. So it's serendipitous that I read this one. Thank you so much to Danny for that. Ola says, I look forward to this podcast every single week. Love you, Shan. Love you too. Genuinely mean that. And you know, I said in this last podcast, you guys are the best. I adore you. Miss Joey 23 says, I love your podcast so much because it allows me to explore different aspects of my emotional self, my physical self, and my mental self. The topics and guests that you have on the show are by far some of the best. I appreciate you. Pretty Sim says, I'm so happy to have found this podcast, Shan. You are an inspiration to me lately. I love how raw you are with us and the fact that you can bring that rawness out of your guests. I can't wait to listen to all the new things this year. Also, Ugly Love was my favorite audiobook. You should listen to Verity by Colin Hoover. It's so good. I did listen to Verity. Actually, the real truth is I didn't listen to Ugly Love. I listened to Verity. And when I read out my audiobooks, I downloaded Ugly Love, but I haven't started it yet. So that was a lie that I want to just come clean about right now. I agree with you. Pretty Sims. Verity is the book. It's the only one that I actually listened to by Colleen Hoover. Speaking of listening, You've done a lot of that, and I appreciate you for that. I'm going to let you go. Have a great week. Next week, we're talking about the relationship between drinking and sex. It's fascinating. I want to say phenomenal and fascinating. It's worth your time. So come back. Bye. Lovers and friends. Lovers and friends. I'm going to take you on a trip, baby. I don't pretend. I say, lovers and friends. Uh, I'm going to hold you down, down to the end. I say, Lovers and Friends is executive produced by Shared Entertainment's Shan Boudram. It is produced by Boudram and Crazier Cruz with production support from 2S Entertainment's Adam Krasner, Isabel Gallant, and Brianna Barone. The Lovers and Friends theme song is produced by Sean Ross and performed by Jared Brady, who also does the scoring and engineering on our episodes. Lovers and Friends is powered by Audio Boom and made possible by our incredible sponsors who you can show love to by reading our show notes.